Build out our program. We have 13 employees, 60 plus members and people involved in our different programs and four different programs. Next slide, please. Our residential program, uh, we have two houses. We have three openings for three residents in our one house and two residents in our other house. So you can see that it's a very intensive individualized program. We currently have two openings. We had someone who graduated to successfully moving into his own apartment recently. Um, our program is we do not take insurance, it's private pay. And it's much more affordable than if you were paying for assisted living. But if you're paying for copay towards assisted living, our program would be more expensive out of pocket. Most of the individuals in our program um, have a special needs trust that allows them to participate in our program. Next slide, please. My apologies, I have to do a couple little things to advance it. I'll get it figured out. Okay, uh, another one of our programs is our independent living program. Frequently people start in our residential program, uh, gain important daily skills, um, social skills, problem solving skills, cognitive skills, make progress towards maintaining um, or advancing in their independence and managing, learning how to manage some of the symptoms of their brain injury and, and work towards some recovery from that. Once they move out of our residential program, we have an independent living program where we support people in their own apartments in the community. And that can be something like grocery shopping, checking um, if they're taking their meds, observing how they fill their med boxes, inviting them to participate in some of our programs in our residential programs, such as art therapy, music therapy, going on outings, and um, attending meals to socialize with people that they used to live with and be connected with. Um, I apologize, I kind of skimmed over our residential program. So you can see one, some of the things that um, we offer in our residential program and when people successfully graduate from that, they can continue to participate through paying um, small fees through a menu of services. Next slide, please. Okay, one of our programs is, another of our program is the Bridgeline Place, our clubhouse program. This is a day program where people go to learn pre-vocational skills. Again, they often work on social skills. They have various work units. One is administrative where people basically handle all the functions of documentation and reporting, taking attendance um, for the program, publishing a newsletter, uh, posting on Facebook, creating a word of the day, those types of things. And they can get uh, assistance with their needs of working on a computer for a variety of personal projects. We have a janitorial unit where people maintain um, the clubhouse, do everything that needs to be done to keep it clean and up and running. And uh, people also help cook lunches and participate in our, most people participate in our lunch program and everyone comes together and that's a nice time to socialize. Next slide, please. Um, I am part of Case Management Services. We serve Charlottesville, counties of Albemarle, Amherst, Appomattox, Buckingham, Fluvanna Green, Louisa, Madison, Nelson, and Orange. So we cover quite a broad area. And I view case management as helping people navigate the system of services they may need after a brain injury, whether that's getting financial assistance, um, needing help applying for social security disability, uh, making sure they have access to the right medical uh, um, providers, occupational therapy, um, a neurologist, a psychiatrist, physical therapy, speech therapy, those types of things. And again, all of our programs are individualized. And in case management, we sit down and say, what 
What are your dreams? What would you like to work on? How can I help you get there? Next slide, please. And a little more about the bridge line. We have an annual comedy show, summer party, volunteering, and we welcome any donations as a great way to honor people that have a brain injury. Next slide. Okay, this is, I think, the key part of um, the presentation in terms of what I commonly see as a case manager and our clubhouse staff, our residential staff, those staff that support people living in the community often run into. So um, Joe has had a stroke three years ago. I'm just going to kind of read through this. He now attends the Bridgeline Clubhouse, lives in his own apartment, has Bridgeline Community Support Services, as well as a Bridgeline case manager. Uh, Joe has been working with case manager for the last year to obtain federal, state, and local public assistance benefits. His grandmother passes away and leaves him $5,000, which he places in his bank account. And these are based on actual cases and scenarios uh, with people I've worked with. He then comes to his case manager because he has received letters that his benefits have been canceled. Next slide, please. Sue was in a car accident. She suffered a traumatic brain injury. She currently is residing in a rehabilitation facility where she receives speech, occupational, and physical therapy. She has Medicaid, which is a type of uh, state and federally funded ins health insurance, and she plans to apply for supplemental security income and social security disability income. Sue's sister leaves her $50,000 and deposits it into Sue's bank account mm -hmm. to cover a year at the Bridgeline residential program and personal expenses. Sue's sister also helps Sue with her Medicaid annual review. The review was completed and Sue's Medicaid was canceled due to the $50,000 gift. Now she must go on a spend down and I'll explain what that is in a moment. Next slide, please. So many public benefits allow for only a certain amount of income cash in the bank and other assets. And usually you want to stay at $2,000 or under in those situations. A person's car and house, if they live in it, are usually excluded as assets. Some benefits may be federal, state, local, or a combination of those funding sources. So all of those um, funding sources have different sets of rules, paperwork that needs to be completed, deadlines, um, some, they're, they're similar, they have similar rules but you can really get tripped up if, for example, one program you need to stay 2,000 and another program uh, may count a financial asset in a different way. Uh, depending on the benefit, different states and localities often have different rules. Next slide, please. So just to go over a little bit about some benefits available in Virginia, Medicaid is health coverage, and I apologize, this is a typo, it's supposed to be persons with low income. We try to always use person-centered language and um, I apologize for that. Supplemental security income is a monthly payment for people with low income. Supplemental nutrition assistance program, SNAP, formerly known as food stamps. A housing choice voucher called HCV was formerly known as section eight housing assistance. And some localities have utilities and weatherization programs. Some people can get assistance in the summer um, with cooling their home and in the winter with heating their home. Um, the spend down that I talked about is if you're on Medicaid and your assets increase, you're no longer eligible for Medicaid until you spend down your assets. So in the previous scenario, that person that was ready to transition to the bridge line would be using some of that money to pay out of pocket for her healthcare expenses, which could, could really be a significant cost to her and probably would keep her from being able to move into the residential program with us and pay um, our fees. 
may also affect her ability to stay in the rehabilitation program where she's at. And so she's facing a medical care and housing crisis based on that. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, people can have a number of benefits. The paperwork is confusing. I myself often consult with a benefit specialist. If I have questions about a particular situation, paperwork can be long and it is helpful to work with a care manager, case manager, benefit specialist when you're applying for benefits. Um, as you can see from the scenarios and from some of the information I've presented, it can be difficult for someone without a brain injury to navigate these services. And it's extremely challenging if they do have a brain injury. And family members and um, clients often, often come to me and say, I wish I would have known this sooner. I had no idea this could happen to me. And often you will get a number of letters from um, benefit workers, um, maybe pamphlets about programs, and you can just feel inundated by that and miss deadlines or um, manage your finances and assets in a certain way that will interfere with you getting those benefits that you definitely could use. Um, and the reason the benefits are so expensive, along with financial planning, is many benefits do not cost, cover the entire cost of a person's basic needs. So in summary, it's very important to consult with a financial professional. Most people I work with, I also encourage to consult with an attorney to make sure their assets are established and managed in a way that doesn't affect the person's benefits. And I think it's time to turn it over to Casey. All right. So you can, uh, go, you can go ahead, Carolyn, and move to the next slide. So my name is Casey Seitz. It's really nice to meet all of you today. Um, and, and Carolyn, you can scroll through. Each of these has like a click through on the bullet. So go ahead and yeah, just load those all up. I always like to start this conversation with families um, regarding some of these statistics because when my husband and I started doing this planning for our daughter, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about here in a minute. We felt really alone. <laughs> it was extremely isolating um, and kind of felt like there weren't a lot of financial advisors out there that really understood how to plan for a loved one with a disability, no matter their age, right? We, we started on this journey very young because our daughter had a brain injury when she was born. But many families that I work with, you know, that, that injury can happen later or a disability um, can result from some type of diagnosis. So I share these with you and you can kind of read through, but some of the ones that I will call out um, that were really impactful to us or to me is, you know, as a full-time caregiver, 77% of people are concerned that they won't be able to retire or achieve financial independence on their own because a lot of those expenses or that planning is going toward their loved one with a disability. And so there's this big fear, there's a lot of anxiety around, hey, how are we gonna do this and manage this when we're caring for someone you know, who really needs a lot of our support? Um, there's some other things on here and, and Beth mentioned the attorney, which we're gonna talk about. You know, a lot of people haven't even written a will or an estate plan, or maybe the estate plan hasn't been updated in a really long time. I run into that a lot. Uh, if you move, especially if you move out of state, or if you're considering moving out of state because you might be retiring somewhere else, that's really, really important to have those documents updated. And then the last one here too is, um, you know, only 20 so percent of families have really created and about 37, 40% work with uh, a financial advisor. And I, I think that's in part because it, a lot of this information is siloed in different places. And so it's very difficult for families to pull it all together into what we would consider a formal plan. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today um, and hopefully give you guys some education and information around how to really do this. 
Okay, Carolyn, you can go to the next slide. All right, and Casey, just so, so you know, just so you know, you're um, cutting out a little bit here and there. Okay. So I'm going to just, if it's where we totally miss everything you say, I'm going to ask you to repeat it. Okay? okay. Sounds good. All right, thank you. So this is my family. Uh, my daughter, you'll see here on the bottom right, she's in a wheelchair and she will be 10 years old in October, which is hard to believe. Uh, she, like I said, she had a brain injury at birth due to my placenta abrupting during a healthy, uh, what was a healthy pregnancy and then labor. And as a result of that brain injury, she had a pretty significant uh, oxygen deprivation event. And so she's got a long list of diagnoses. You also see we have another child um, that he was born two years after Hudson. Uh, thankfully, very healthy. I think if someone would have told me that I was uh, having a boy that is this high energy and, you know, if, if I would have more than just him, I think I would have changed my mind. Maybe he's, he's amazing. We love him. Uh, but he constantly, you know, is challenging us on lots of different levels. But anyway, so Hudson is, like I said, nine. She's amazing. She's survived a lot of things that I think people, many people wouldn't be able to survive as a baby. Uh, but because of her is why I'm here. And I have been in financial services for a long time, but I really started specializing in doing planning for those with a disability about six, seven years ago. And I work with a lot of families all over the country. So no matter where you are on this planning journey, um, I think it's really important to talk about what, who does your team need to be and what are some of the pieces of information uh, that you need to have in order to navigate this. And so as a result, and, and that's also how I met Mercy, who's on the, the call today, she's part of my team. You know, we train and mentor a lot of other advisors across the country, just because this isn't, this is very complex planning, and this isn't information that is, I guess, readily available or trained in the financial services industry. So, um, you know, we, we work really hard to make sure that we're providing this education to everybody. Okay, next slide, please. Our mission and our firm is to educate all the strategic partners that we work with that can be family members, obviously, uh, case managers like Beth, social workers along the way, benefits experts, and certainly attorneys and anybody else that the family has a planning relationship with. We want to make sure everybody's on the same page. And so we guide the caregivers, we facilitate all these emotional conversations about how to create this high quality of life for everyone in the family uh, so that, you know, no loopholes are missed and some of the examples that Beth gave you uh, are avoided. Next slide, please. So some of the things we hear every week, and again, this isn't dependent on whether you have a young child or an adult child with a disability. Um, this is very consistent across the board. So we don't know where to start. It's too overwhelming. What we have in place right now is we think really good, but um, we're not totally sure about, you know, some of these loopholes that you're referencing. I hear a lot, we've got it all taken care of, right? Uh, and then, you know, wealthy families don't need this planning. You know, Beth mentioned some of the federal benefits that apply if a family has low income or is below the poverty line. However, a lot of families do have wealth and you know that could be a hundred thousand dollars it could be a million dollars whatever it is i think the um the key here is that we need a plan no matter where you are on that on that spectrum okay next slide please so one of the things i often talk about is it's it's never too soon to start planning i also think that as long as we're doing this while you're alive and cognitive and everybody's on the same page, you know, it's never too late either. So you don't have to do everything at once and you have a lot of support along the way. We're gonna to talk today about um, building your team. So you can go to the next slide, Carolyn. We'll talk about how to develop this type of planning. What are special needs trusts? How do they work? And then we'll talk briefly also about ABLE plans. I don't know if any of you have heard of those, but they're a very popular uh, financial account and tool that if you have an adult or a child with a disability that was diagnosed under the age of 26, this is a really good thing to have um, in at the table for the family. 
and also for the adult with a disability to create some independence. Okay, so again, like Beth said, families should never leave more than $2,000 directly to an adult or a child with a disability, even if it's in a jointly held account. And that's because of all the federal benefits that she just mentioned. And again, some of those can be state and local as well. And uh, when you're planning for a loved one um, with a disability, uh, next slide, please, Carolyn. We talk about three team members to have at the table. One is a financial professional. That could be myself or Mercy, but that could really be anyone that you're comfortable working with. Um, you do need to work with someone that is in my opinion, certified in what's called special needs planning, and that has a specific designation to it. So there's extra training and extra information that that advisor really needs to do proper planning in this space. The second person is a government benefits specialist. We'll talk a little bit more about what they do in a minute. And then you also need an estate planning attorney that has a lot of experience doing what we call as either elder law planning or disability planning. Okay. So what do each of these people do? Well, the estate planning attorney is the person who's gonna basically develop these documents that will protect any assets that you leave to that child or the adult with a disability from being qualified or disqualified from those government benefits. So ideally, this special needs trust is put in place. If you have an adult child over the age of 18, you know, sometimes we talk about financial guardianship or health care, power of health care, or sometimes full guardianship if that's needed. For example, my daughter, she's most likely not going to be someone that qualifies to live at the Bridgeline residential home just because, you know, we're having to do a lot of her uh, care 24 seven and all of her financial management for her, at least right now. Um, but, you know, that can change over time. Th people develop and they can overcome those brain injuries if they're not as significant. The things that the attorney will do is they're going to work with you as caregivers or whomever in the family is going to be taking over the care for that child with a disability or adult with a disability. So then I'll talk to you about a will, powers of attorney, powers of health care. There's also something called a letter of intent. That's basically the set of instructions that the caregivers will leave to the family member or whoever is taking over care uh, upon them passing away. So it's sort of like this mini instruction booklet. And we've got a nice little PDF if you guys would like one. I'm more than happy to email that to you, um, it, you know, at the end of the presentation so you can see what an example looks like there. The second person is the financial advisor. So they're going to talk about all the money. They're going to talk about the insurance. How does this all work? How is everything funded? What actually needs to go into the special needs trust? And is it enough? You know, sometimes I work with families where we can only do what we can only do for a certain period of time. And, you know, it is what it is. Other families, you know, they have a lot more in assets. And so um, they want to make sure the other children or heirs in the family are also protected. So there, sometimes that requires a little bit more conversation. And then last but not least is the government benefits expert. Sometimes this is a case manager like Beth, who's very fluent at the state, local, and federal programs and the applications. Sometimes though, this is also a person who can give us an idea of what will it cost to take care of the adult with a disability after mom and dad are gone or after the caregivers have passed away. And so that cost planning is really important to the financial advisor because then the financial advisor can start talking with the family about how to plan for the funding of the special needs trust. So you can see really easily how all of these people need to be working together on your family's behalf. And then sometimes we're working with other professionals or resources, um, therapists, physicians, you know, maybe educational type programs, um, voc rehab, I sit on the Kansas Developmental Disabilities Council and we're often talking about you know, independent employment. What does that look like and how does that incorporate into the benefits for the individual with a disability? Okay, next slide, please. So what we do when we sit down and talk with a family is we have to understand where you are right now and then what is the vision you want, not only for your future, but also for your adult child. You know, where will they live? Who's going to provide the day to care? What social activities um, do you want them to be part of? You know, and thinking about adults with 
brain injuries that can get very isolating um, after school is over and once they become an adult. And so how do we build in the socialization and a community around them? And the bridge line is really good at that uh, and supporting that. And so again, really talking about the life vision because the money is important, but until we really know what you want or what quality of life you want for your family and your family member, uh, it's very difficult to develop in the, the resources and the financial plan um, to go behind that. Okay, next slide. So when we get an idea of where you are, where you wanna go, then we start talking about details on the benefits that your adult child is eligible for. So that's everything from a lot of the things that Beth mentioned earlier, SSI, there's, there can be Social Security retirement income, and that can play into what's called a bump up in the SSI payment. Medicaid is a big one, uh, vocational services, certainly public school benefits while uh, kids are in school. Um, it could be day programs once they become an adult, lots of different things there. And then if you have any family members with military service, the VA does a pretty good job of giving us some extra support and extra benefits there that I find a lot of families are unaware of. And so if we don't know what they are or what the whole gamut and menu of services are, oftentimes families will leave either money or resources on the table that really could alleviate a lot of financial strain on the family over time. So we wanna make sure we're maximizing those. Now I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Go ahead and um, do two slides there, Carolyn. I'm gonna give you a couple of examples here on social security, for example. If you have a child with a disability under the age of 18, then the parent's income and assets or the caregiver's income and assets are the ones that count when qualifying for supplemental security income. They also take into consideration the household size and then any assets. So what they're doing is they're looking for that $2,000 limit and how much income is coming into the household based on how many people live there. And then they determine, okay, the child is eligible or the child is not. However, once the child turns 18, then that child's income and assets are the one, is the one that counts for SSI qualification. So this is why when we talk about leaving assets to someone or um, providing an income stream, I have a lot of parents who think that leaving a pension income stream to their child with a disability is a great idea, when in fact that would kick them off of a lot of different benefits. So we have to do this planning appropriately, but once that child turns 18, they can qualify and the maximum amount for SSI this year is $783 a month. So like Beth mentioned, it covers some things, right? But $783 a month is probably not going to pay for everything that either the bridge line needs or, or maybe your family member really needs to live on. And so that's where we have to start planning. And also, by the way, if we have an adult with a disability who's working, right? We, we wanna make sure that um, that employment income is considered and how that employment income is used is also really important or where it's saved uh, is really important. Okay, next slide. So once the caregiver, at least one of the caregivers retires and starts taking Social Security retirement, and if that child, adult child or otherwise, was considered disabled before age 22, then you can actually receive, or that child can receive a bump up in their Social Security or SSI payment, and that bump up lives with them then for the rest of their life. So it's really, really important that we start talking with families or caregivers on when do you select Social Security retirement, because that makes a difference. And you know, how much is that going to be? How can we estimate that to provide for some of the income long-term for the child? So again, my point here is, like Beth said, it's really complicated. There's a lot of red tape when it comes to applying for these different federal benefits. And the examples I gave you today are just one out of all of the different ones that we talked about. Uh, we could probably do a whole workshop on, you know, just benefits and accessing them and how they work. Okay, next slide, please. The benefits specialist is, is really, really important. Not only are they going to help us maximize those benefits and make sure we protect them going forward, but they're also going to do that cost planning that I talked about. So we work with a variety of different people that would be called the benefits expert, but typically this is an organization um, that specializes in 
figuring out where do you want to live or where do you want your adult child living? Um, what is the care that you as a caregiver are providing? And then how do we supplement or, or replace that parent when they pass away or become disabled themselves? Um, and then how much does that cost, right? So we get this annual number and then we net out or we subtract what the benefits are gonna pay for. And so sometimes that's a positive number, sometimes that's a negative number. It just depends on you know, what the family's vision is. But the important thing to remember here is at some point, we've got to have that fully independent plan for the child or the adult with a disability so that their quality of life doesn't unnecessarily have to change when caregivers pass away or when the caregivers are no longer able to manage the care themselves. Okay, so really, really important. A lot of financial planners miss that. Um, I hear a lot of, you know, financial advisors that will talk about, oh, do some investment planning and here's some insurance and this is how this all works, but nobody's actually done the cost planning for the, the adult child. And I don't really know how you start talking about things like insurance and investments until you know exactly what the cost is going to be, right? So sometimes we can estimate this to our best of our ability, but I do think a formal cost plan for the adult with a disability is really, really important. And by the way, that can change over time. You know, they, they might um, become more independent or they may, their disability may progress. And so how does that then change the planning for them and, and what supports are, are in place um, when those changes happen? Okay, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about what are called third party special needs trusts. Um, these are created by the attorney that I mentioned earlier. And they, we can leave any type of asset in a special needs trust that the family desires. It can be a business, it can be a house, it can be investment assets, it can be insurance. Uh, life insurance, for example, is a really popular way to fund these. Um, and then once we put that or dedicate those assets uh, to the special needs trust for the benefit of the adult child with a disability, their government benefits are not affected that way. And they get to keep the inheritance or anything that the family is wanting to leave for them as support. So it's really good. It, it combines the best of both of these worlds. And you saw, you know, Beth mentioned there's common pitfalls that she hears all the time. A family member thinks they're helping. And in fact, it's, it's causing a lot of problems with the, the government benefits that are already in place. And so it's really important um, this information gets out to family members so that they can do the right planning and those beneficiary designations uh, are done correctly. Okay, anyone except your loved one with special needs can contribute to this. Okay, so it can be aunts, uncles, friends, it can be non-family members, um, you know, in, really anyone that wants to set this up. And if the person or the adult with a disability passes away in a third party special needs trust, the any remaining assets will go either back to the family or if you want it to go to a charity or nonprofit like the bridge line for example that can be arranged as well you get to have control of where the leftover assets go all right so that's a third party special needs trust okay next slide please um you certainly want to work with an estate planning attorney or what's called an elder law attorney to draft your trust um, you don't want to work with just any attorney in this space and i say that because Every state's uh, social security department, as well as their Medicaid department, actually have attorneys on staff. I didn't know this until a few months ago. Um, last year I was attending a workshop. And they have these attorneys on staff to actually review the family's special needs trust when they're applying for benefits. So they're looking to make sure that the language in that trust is appropriate according to social security guidelines so that nothing in there is counted as an asset. Um, and it serves them to do that, right? Because otherwise they get to deny benefits and save the state and the federal government some money. Uh, so it's really, really important that these trusts are written appropriately as well as executed appropriately by either a corporate trustee or if you have a family member that is educated about being a trustee, certainly that can happen as well. Um, the trust can be set up so any remaining assets, like I said, pass to family members and, you know, because 
paying for a, an adult with a disability can sometimes be quite expensive over a long period of time. A lot of people will think about life insurance as a way to fund a special needs trust so that they're not necessarily having to sacrifice their own retirement accounts to do that. Um, but, you know, again, that's, that's not the only way. There's a lot of different options. Uh, it just tends to be the most cost effective if we can get it done uh, for a family because you can get a large death benefit tax free to a trust for a smaller amount of premium. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, and you can click through a couple of these too, Carolyn. So this is the letter of intent. I'm more than happy to send this to you guys. Um, this is an electronic PDF. So you actually can type in and edit this on your computer screen. And it really just describes what you do as a caregiver. So it's, it's obviously all the doctor contact information, specialists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, whoever, your family is using for those services. But it also talks about things like, you know, for example, Hudson, she, she has epilepsy. Uh, so she has seizures on a pretty regular basis and she loves fireworks. Like the 4th of July in our house is a big deal. But because of the loud noise of the fireworks, sometimes those will cause a seizure for her. And so we like to allow her to watch them on a TV screen with no volume. So she loves watching fireworks. It's just we have to do it in a way that you know protects her from having a seizure. Now, nobody else may know that, right? They may read her list of diagnoses and, and never know that. Um, that won't that information won't be necessarily in a will. It won't be necessarily even in a case management plan uh, or a family service plan. But this is the place, the letter of intent is the place where we can put those little details that becomes super important if all of a sudden you're not here tomorrow. And so the letter of intent, in my opinion, is again the set of instructions we can leave to the next person in line to do the caregiving that keeps consistency for the adult or the child with a disability so that they don't have to, you know, have any trauma, any more trauma than losing their parent or their caregiver, but also keep them safe and, and keep them in a high quality of life and we don't miss you know, that care coordination piece. So again, if you guys want this, if you'd like a copy of this, totally free, I'll send that to anybody. Um, and this is called a letter of intent. Okay, let's talk a little bit about ABLE accounts. So they, these were written into law as of 2014 and they are fairly new in the world of disability planning. Um, these are called 529A, so not a traditional 529 plan, but a 529A. And they, it, the ABLE stands for Achieving a Better Life Experience. So this is actually brought into law by a group of families who had adult children with a disability. Um, the federal regulations around these are you have to have had a disability onset prior to age 26. So unfortunately, a lot of the TBI families or those who have a brain injury maybe or a stroke later in life are not currently going to qualify for these. However, if you have a younger person who does have an onset of a disability earlier than 26, these certainly will apply. The, any money, uh, they can only receive cash, right? We can't put investment accounts or life insurance or anything like that into ABLE, but they can receive cash deposits. If an adult is working and is disabled, they can also put their own income into an ABLE account. So these can be quite helpful for supporting and uh, creating independence for an adult with a disability. And we also wanna make sure that the account balance, if the person is on SSI, doesn't go over $100,000, otherwise it will count. The maximum amount right now that you can put into ABLE accounts is $15,000 per year cumulatively. So if mom puts in $10,000, dad may only be able to put in $5,000 and then we've received our maximum for that year. And that's a calendar year. Contributions are post tax federally. However, in Virginia, you guys get a state tax deduction per contributor. So if my aunt wants to put in $2,000 to Hudson's ABLE account and we lived, we all lived in Virginia, then my aunt would receive a $2,000 state tax deduction. If I put in $2,000, then I would receive a Virginia $2,000 state tax deduction. So there's an incentive for other people to contribute at that level if they want to. And this, this is my favorite part, is that these accounts are liquid, so you can use them, you can use the, the money in them anytime for as long as it's for a qualifying disability expense, and they grow tax-free, tax-free. 
How many people love that? I love that. I love the idea of not sending the IRS as much of the tax money. Right? So the more money we can protect for the adult with a disability, the better. Um, so again, only account of its kind that isn't going to be counted against the adult with a disability where the money inside of it grows tax-free. That's incredible. So we like these. We think these are extremely helpful for a lot of families. Um, they are working, by the way, on legislation to increase that age, uh, but that has not been approved yet. So we will, we will keep you posted on when and if it goes above the age of 26. Okay, next slide. Some of the, the expenses that are qualified, it, you know, these, these, these are specific examples, but it's very broad right now of what you can use ABLE money for. Um, I will say one of the biggest things I want to mention here is you have to spend the SSI money first, and then we can supplement with ABLE. So we never want to take someone's rent payment as a priority out of ABLE if they are receiving SSI and they're an adult. Um, certainly we can use it for anything else. We can use it for, you know, education, technology, transportation, anything that SSI really wouldn't pay for. Now, if you're a younger, if you're a minor and you're not on SSI, you can use it really for anything. Um, I, it's probably easier to say what you can't use ABLE for, and that's things like we can't take the prepaid debit card to an ATM machine, and that's just to protect the financial security or the safety of the individual with a disability. We can't buy cigarettes with it. We cannot buy alcohol with it. And then things like gambling and adult entertainment, those aren't allowed, but pretty much anything else. Okay, so um, this is great. Now, I will mention too, and this is one of the concerns a lot of families have is any money that we have left in an ABLE account at the time that the, the person with the disability passes away, uh, Medicaid, the state Medicaid agency, if that person is on Medicaid can come back and put a lien on the account. In other words, um, hey, we wanna pay back based on you know, what this person received from Medicaid over their lifetime. But I'll tell you, uh, funeral expenses, final expenses can be used. That's a qualifying expense from an ABLE account. So I tell a lot of families, I wouldn't worry too much about the Medicaid payback simply because these accounts, remember, can't go over $100,000 in total uh, if we don't want that affecting benefits. And so, you know, I make a little bit of a joke, but I'm half serious that if Hudson passed away and she had, you know, $20,000 left in her account, I'm, uh, I'm going to throw like a Disney funeral. I mean, we're just going to spend it on a funeral, okay? Or, um, you know, adults who, like Beth said, want to go out and go to a movie or, uh, you know, they, they want to go with their friends to a social activity. They can take that prepaid debit card and it's an ABLE account money, qualified expense, and that could be their spending money. So um, these are really, really good. Next slide is the uh, website that you can go to to learn more about ABLE accounts, which is ablenrc.org. Okay, so this is run by the National Disability Institute out of Washington, D.C., so again, they're federally funded, but these are run by each individual state. And in Virginia, um, the, the ABLE accounts are run by the state treasury department. So, you know, this is where you can learn exactly what they look like, how they work. All of you are able to open an ABLE account today if you qualify or have a child that qualifies uh, right from your home. You don't need a financial advisor. You don't need a bank. You don't need an attorney. You can do it all online. It's very, very simple. I've worked with a lot of adults who have disabilities and they can open their own account uh, online by themselves if they have the wherewithal to do that. Um, but have helped a lot of families you know, figure this out. All the states in blue that you see on that map are the ones that offer ABLE accounts. The ones in green currently do not. That doesn't mean though that people that live in those states can't open another state's plan. Okay, so just so you know, uh, even if you live in a green state, it doesn't mean that you can't have an ABLE account. Okay. Next slide. Um, and you know, don't forget to plan for yourself too. We, we talk a lot about our, our kids or adults with disabilities and sometimes we forget about ourselves and that's easy to do. Lots of situations depend on the caregiver, right? So Hudson is financially and caregiving wise dependent on my husband and I all the time. 
I mean, you know, the, so our financial security is very, very important in order for her to have financial security. So I always encourage people, you know, sit down, review your plan. Uh, if you would like help with that, let us know. We can point you in the right direction for resources on that. And then next, um, next slide. So just to review, make sure that the planning that you have, you, you have goals set. You know, I talk to a lot of families who have not figured out yet what the future vision is going to look like for the caregiving or the adult with a disability situation. So just make sure that you know we're all in communication there and, and you have some of those goals outlined when you sit down with either the advisor or an estate planning attorney. You know, set the priorities. I work with a lot of families that get overwhelmed. This is a lot to do. It's very complex and it can take a long time. And so what we try to do is create little step-by-step -step pieces that have I don't know about you, but I like a checklist. So anytime I can check something off a list, uh, it makes me feel good and it makes me feel like I'm creating progress. And so make sure that plan is customized for you and your family. And then certainly, like I mentioned before, life can change, right? Um, so you need to update your plan on a regular basis. Sometimes that's annual. If a lot of things are changing, that can be every month. It can be quarterly, especially if, when we have a child that is uh, turning 18 or getting ready to turn 18, that's usually when we're working together quite a bit to make sure that adult transition plan um, is in alignment with the goals of the family. Okay, and then last slide, please. Uh, choosing a financial advisor or professional, you know, obviously work with someone you trust. I think that's a no-brainer, but um, definitely ask questions about their experience in special needs planning or disability planning. Do they have the certification? How long have they been doing it? Why are they doing it? Make sure that they are going to be around and that they will work with you for a long period of time. This shocks most people, even though um, I have not had my special needs financial planning practice for 10 years yet. Um, on average, right, the, the lifespan of what we're talking about here is 30 to 40 years of planning. So you wanna make sure you're working with a company that's gonna be around, um, that if it is an individual advisor, you know, they have a succession plan for who's going to be with you long term if they are older. Um, because, you know, we, we, as a financial advisor, you, you may not be around forever. Uh, most of us won't be. So what does that look like when you're gone? You know, are you going to have the good, a good team in place for your adult child? Okay, and then next slide. So assemble your team. Financial advisor, government benefits specialist, estate planning attorney. Develop the plan, right? So work with them to get your current situation on paper. Decide what you want for the future. Access and maximize the benefits. And then again, that big piece, estimating the future cost of care when you're not here anymore to do it yourself. What does that look like? And finally, you know, establish and funding the funding plan for the special needs trust and or the ABLE account. Uh, also, don't forget to plan for yourself. Okay, so we're right up to 10 minutes. We're more than happy to answer some questions. I, I think, Beth, you still have some time, right? Putting everybody back here. So if anybody has any questions, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and um, yeah. It was a, a lot of really good, a lot of complex information. Yes, certainly. And it's all given in the span of 40 minutes. So I'm, I'm sure that, uh, digesting all of that on a Wednesday is a bit challenging. Holly, how do we get your uh, PDF file you mentioned? You can either send that to Carolyn or Michael, or if you'd like, um, you know, to shoot me an email, I, I can send it directly to you. Either way, Tom. Okay. Um, Casey, you want me to type your uh, email in the chat? Would that yeah, work for great. you, Tom? Sure. Okay. Great. Just a general question, Casey, and I think this is something that might help the whole group, but um, I feel like I can probably say this with uh, it being correct. I would assume that most everybody knows somebody who has been impacted with someone that has a disability. That being said, whether they're uh, personally related or family friends of somebody that has had the situation, how 
in general for the group, should we use this information to um, educate or digest it? Um, because, I mean, in general, it's a heavy topic, but we want to be able to see actionable results. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, you know, workshops like this are really good. Um, you know, asking uh, people like Beth, who is an excellent case manager, or, you know, social workers that you're close to are also really good. Um, you know, we do, Mercy and I do quite a bit of other workshops around disability planning. So if you guys want some access to those uh, online workshops, sometimes it takes a few times of hearing this, right? It's not just like, oh, I get it, and I'll just create my checklist today, and it all looks great. Uh, it took me a really long time as a mom to get this on paper and feel good about it. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I totally agree, Mercy, that it, it can be a lot. And I think the big key here is just to start, right? Like just start gathering information and putting things down so that um, something, uh, you know, the form of a plan starts to, starts to happen. Mm -hmm. I have a clarifying question, I guess, and it's about relatives or actually I think it might be anyone, but being able to contribute to um, ABLE accounts, um, and get tax write-offs for that. I mean, I'm not in a position where I can, um, you know, give lots of money, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, I have cousins who have disabilities and if I'm able to start early, you know, over the course of the next 10 years, I could really make a huge impact, yeah. um, on what they're set up with. Um, is that right? So that, that's a great point, Michael. I'll, I'll, Double clarify, it's not a federal tax deduction, so don't be confused by that, okay? So it's only state, and Virginia has a specific rule that says it's a maximum per year per contributor of $2,000, right? So if you put in $5,000, you're only going to get a $2,000 state tax deduction for that individual you're contributing to. Does that make sense? Yeah. And again, each individual person so per social security number, you can only have one ABLE account. So you can't have, unlike a, a regular 529, you can't have multiple ABLE accounts. You can only have one. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. But yeah, I mean, absolutely. I would have loved to have ABLE accounts when Hudson was little um, because I think family members would have been able to not only take advantage of the state tax deduction, but had a meaningful way to, you know, give birthday money or Christmas money or, you know, something small that, they didn't know what to buy her. You know, she wasn't playing with toys or, you know, I got lots of clothes and lots of hair bows. She has so many hair bows, I can't even tell you. Um, because, you know, we did a lot with her hair. But it would have been really nice to have a place that people could have put something meaningful that we could have used for equipment or, um, you know, technology that she now uses that not all insurance and benefits really covered. Anybody else, any more questions or comments? If you um, do have a question and I'm not noticing that, if you just wanna unmute yourself. I'm curious, was this helpful for a lot of you? I, I wanna make sure we're giving you guys good solid information, um, obviously between Beth and I both, but uh, was this helpful? Was it valuable today? Did you learn anything new? Got a thumbs up there, and um, I know someone else said thank you for sharing your story and helping share critical information. Awesome. Thank you. And thank Nancy you. gave you a thumbs up. That's yeah. awesome. I don't even know how to do that. Look at you with the thumbs up icon. <laughs> oh, I didn't even see that. <laughs> That's great. That's cool. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. All right, excellent. Well, if you guys, thanks, Katie. Thank if you, you guys have other um, questions or information, Please reach out uh, either to Carolyn or Mike. All right.
Thank Sorry. You, Carolyn, that's all I had, unless you had anything else you wanted to. Thank mention. you very much for coming. And um, oh, thank you. Yeah, and my email is Carolyn at the center .org. I'll put that in the chat if anybody is looking for how to get in touch with anybody. Um, or you can just call the center and say, can, can I talk to Carolyn? She'll, I'll get it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if All you right. want more information about the bridge line, my email is B Elliot, that's E L L I O T T, at the bridgeline.org. Okay. And By the I'm way, the bridge it. line has a really awesome video on YouTube if you want to watch it. I watched it again this morning. I was like, oh, I need to duplicate that and just bring that to Kansas City where I am. It's so awesome. Nice. Well, thank you all for your time. And um, thank yeah. you. Thank, Michael, Casey, thanks thank for recording. For... Carolyn, thanks so much. No problem. Thank you. All thanks right. Me. Jean, well, hope yeah. to see you again. And whoever's in the background there, nice to see you too. <laughs> all right. Take care, y'all. Bye, Nancy. Bye.